Michel Perez. We, we wait for Michel Perez. I think he will. Uh, Antonio? Yeah, yeah, he's joining. Hola, Antonio. Okay. Hola, Silvia. <laughs> Hola. Todo el mundo habla español? Todo el mundo. Uh, not muy bien, not muy bien. Next time, maybe. ¿Dónde está el supermercado? Yes. Ashley, my little coach. So, uh, so Senda also is, is with us. Hi, hi. Hi, Sina. Hi, Damiana, Antonio, hey. Serge. Hi, Natalia. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Najet. Hola, Najet. Najet. Najet is here also. Najet is there, yeah. Hi. Yes. We are not respecting uh, the, the social distance in uh, <laughs> the <laughs> No, me aspecto. We are we are all in the same so in the same room. Huh? Are you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. How many is in the same room? No, we are just six. Six. Okay, that's good. That's <laughs> a maximum. That's a French word. Okay. You like it to this also? You have windows open and everything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Yes, the windows are open. Our our children in school will when winter comes and they have to do everything with windows open for once. No. But uh, we were in, a, in another in another room, but we were um, fired. We're not fired. Not we're fired. Uh, <laughs> 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 I hope not. Bonjour Antoine, bonjour Daniana, Zilia, bonjour tout le monde, Heidi, hello everyone, hola, hola, hola. <laughs> Antonio, vous restez à Perry pour la Navidad. Yes. So, yeah, this year we're staying at home. No, it's too complicated to, to travel. <laughs> Do you have some uh, some news about uh, the festivity in the end of the year? Do you have the right to to to, to go outside? Or, or well, see, you can change from one week to another. For now, the cases are going up again. Well, yeah, because the cases are going up again. So they were supposed to open much more today. I mean, yeah, and they might go back. So we don't know. We we have that last week. Mm. Are you very, very risky now? Are you working at home? At home. Everyone is at, at home. home. Okay. okay. Only the research, only the people working in the labs are allowed to go to Pasteur, okay. so to diminish the number of people that are in campus. So you need to have a special request and etc. Did you appreciate We have the same. In Tunisia, we will have uh, some news on the thir thir 31th of December. Okay. So for the moment, it's the same uh, for them. So we have. Uh, No. So. So, do, do, do you want me to to begin the present, or will we wait uh, for Hervé? Yeah, no, no, Michel. Michel. Yes, is not Michel. Yeah, yeah. And will the student join as well? Because it's only. Yeah. Today we will have the 
the fifth uh, webinar, so the last one in this series. And I hope that uh, afterwards we will have some uh, some activities in uh, in in presence. I don't know if it's possible, mm -hmm. but uh, we hope so. We wish, no? We wish, we all wish. <laughs> You, do, do, when you will receive the vaccine of COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet. That's the million, the question of the million, not we say in, in, in no. Spanish. <laughs> well, I, some countries were starting, I think US and UK, they were already starting with Pfizer's, I read today. Yes. Mm. So I don't think it will take long, but anyway, I don't think there will be, you know, the, the solution, the, the sudden recovery of everything. I mean, that uh, will be small groups of people. I don't, I don't know. I don't know precisely whether. And Damiana, I don't know if you know whether there is any plan already for vaccination plan here. I have not read the news. On, I know, the, but it was a while ago. They were saying like priorities, not first older people and carers and medical staff, and then. But yeah, I, yeah. I don't know any detailed plan, but I think it's the same like for every country. They plan to, exactly. to vaccinate the most. Oh, Michel, we have yeah. Michel. Bonjour, it's Michel. Right on time. Hello. <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour. Hello, Hello, Michel. Michel. <laughs> so right on time, yes. It's the third yeah. year. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's begin. Uh, so hello and welcome to the fifth in a webinar of so the series designed as part of the Find Access project, whose uh, Professor Helmi Merdesi, the coordinator at the Institute Pastor of Tunis, Dr. Sinda Zarruk, World Packet 6 Task Leader of 6.4, Head of Core Facilities at the Institute Pastor of Tunis, and Professor Balkis Buhawela, also World Packet 6 Task Leader 6.2, Research Project Leader uh, at the Institute Pastor of Tunis. And myself, so I'm Usama Ben Fadel, World Package 6 and Task 6.45 leader, and head of the newborn TTO CVT2. So, Cellule de Valorisation et Transfer Technologique. So, I host this webinar with my colleague Antonio Bauderia. So, Dr. Antonio Bauderia is the business development manager for the Digital Strategy Tech Transfer Office at Institut Pasteur de Paris. In addition, he's also part of the Innovation Development Office helping researchers and mature and develop their, their innovation. So this afternoon, we will hear from international experts who help to accelerate transfer, technology transfer. So we will have Sylvia Totora from CRG, Serge Poyac and Michel Perez from Institut Pasteur de Paris. Hi, Antonio. So I, uh, I will let Siva Totola present herself because she had the presentation, a good presentation. And, uh, and, and, so, be so. <laughs> and because I was late, sorry. Yeah, that's my fault. <laughs> I didn't share the profile. <laughs> you can blame me. You can blame me, Osama. <laughs> and then afterwards, I will leave the floor to Antonio, if you have some, some words to say now, or if you want to, to, uh, to let your uh, your presentation after after the presentation of Silvia. Yeah, I think we'll do it after Silvia. That's fine. Okay. So Silvia, I leave you the floor. I leave you the floor. Okay. Thank you. I will share my screen as fast as this allows me. So just a second, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Well, this uh, oops. Okay. Let's see if you can uh, see my screen as I do. Yes. Okay. Is that okay now? Can you see? Yes. Uh, just a few seconds, I think. Yes. It's, it's loading. Everybody can see that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. No yes. Now okay. it's good. Yes. Okay, okay. Good. Then again, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and for letting me share with you my personal experience on the maturation of, uh, of a TTO. Um, as um, Osama was saying, I should have, uh, you know, sent uh, some uh, description of myself for, uh, you know, proper introduction, but uh, I already included something here. And uh, yeah, that's me in a nutshell, uh, quickly. I've been, uh, you know, through different countries and uh, I did, I'm a biologist by training. I did my PhD in, in, in Barcelona after some uh, 
um, some stages in in uh, in the faculties of biology and, and medicine and a PhD and, and, a, and a master in, in immunology. My PhD was uh, on uh, the intersection between the clinical and biological aspects of, of cancer. Uh, with uh, Miguel Peinado at the at what was at the time called the Institute for Oncology Research, and um, yeah, once this uh, over, I'm um, sorry, I'm the other way around. Once this over, I moved to Geneva for a postdoc uh, with uh, medical doctor Marc Cantona Raymond, uh, also working on uh, on uh, the intersection between the clinics and, and uh, biology of of cancer. And later on, when he moved uh, away from uh, the Fondation for Recherche Medicale, where I was doing uh, my postdoc, I joined uh, the team of Professor Werner Schlegel, working there on, on more fundamental things of uh, team regulation. In parallel, I was doing, uh, because I became uh, at the time a shareholder of a newly incorporated company, developing um, oncology uh, biomarkers and, and prognostic factors and so on. I also did uh, sort of uh, the, the, the seeds of what is now an MBA uh, at the EPFL, the, the Federal Institute of Technology in, in Lausanne. Uh, that was at the time called the Create Entrepreneurship course. That was six months uh, of um, a, small, a brief MBA with, uh, with uh, you know, all the basics of, of it. And uh, from there, I moved to Germany to uh, become a research scientist and at uh, Europrotium AG. That was this company that I uh, had been founder of, uh, but uh, because of personal reasons, I did not want to move uh, when it was created. I decided to apply competitively when a position was available and I got it. So I had the chance uh, in the meantime to learn uh, French and German, which have been always big motivations for me to travel and uh, go abroad. And then at some point, company closed. That was uh, around the 2004, uh, you know, the bubble for the biotechs, uh, especially in, in, in Germany. And then I moved back to Spain to start what at the time was not even called technology transfer. So uh, it became technology transfer. Uh, I was engaged, uh, you know, to link uh, between uh, the CRG and uh, what had been uh, the, the embryo of uh, the business board uh, then. I also became member of the Clinical Research uh, Ethical Committee, and I'm since then a member. I, I mean, I, I did not volunteer, but I, I do volunteer now. It's it's a, an amazing uh, learning process. And uh, since then, when I have uh, been uh, starting and, and uh, through all the process of the TBDO or, or, or the creation of uh, technology transfer at the CRG, with two periods in between, I will show you as acting head uh, because of uh, the leave of, of uh, the responsible head uh, at the time. So, yeah, why am I there? I mean, uh, quickly uh, about my technology transfer, um, you know, experience. Uh, it's been always at the CRG, although I've been in, in industry before, but I've been overall responsible for uh, a big amount of the output of the department, uh, most of the IP portfolio there, more, of, more than half of the agreements that we've signed uh, and, and more than half of the commercial agreements that we've signed. I've had secure uh, around 1 million uh, valorization grants really contributed to creation of spin-offs companies, the first one uh, at the time, and I will come to that, and then uh, one more recently. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to be active also in, in training and and, uh, and uh, coaching of, of researchers, lecturing and, and uh, organizing with Damiana some internal courses. Okay, so that's me, but I didn't come here not to talk about me, but to talk about uh, you know the, the maturation of a technology uh, transfer office. I'm thinking about how I could uh, frame that or what I could tell that could be useful. I thought that because I've been so many years at the CRG, the best would be, you know, to give you an overview of what has been the CRG tech transfer through the years, starting with uh, what, and I don't know if you see that uh, big enough, starting with ha what has been the, the human resources, uh, how the human resources have evolved through the years in, in the office. So as I was telling you, I, do you see my, I don't think you see my my arrow, right, in the screen? Yes. You do? Ah, oh, great. Okay, sometimes. thanks. That's fine. <laughs> then I, yes. I, I don't know, because otherwise I, I have to be careful. <laughs> okay. Well, as I told you, I, I started at the CRG when uh, there was no even technology transfer. And uh, at some point, uh, that was uh, September 2005. And at some point uh, in 2008, uh, there was a new incorporation, a new head, uh, Javier Rubias, uh, MBA and, and PhD also. And uh, within the years, so uh, two more junior members incorporated sequentially. So we had uh, support from one junior member. 
Um, Xavier Rubias left uh, sometime in 2013, and then we incorporated Pablo Cironi. Pablo Cironi has been leading the office uh, until mid-2018, and I will tell you more about those different periods. And uh, within uh, his uh, mandate, let's say like that, uh, more people joined the office, uh, more senior people also, Salvatore Capadona, PhD, and also maybe not a senior member, but already uh, much more experienced than uh, prior junior members. Peter Stinen, and then uh, lately uh, Pablo left uh, in uh, 2018. I spent eight months as acting head, uh, and uh, Annabel Sanz, uh, who you heard last uh, week, uh, incorporated uh, May 2019, and we've been uh, there since, uh, trying to you know continue with uh, with the activities. We've always had uh, the office administrative support part-time, it was internal. It's more relevant than you would think when you want to have a, a, a TTO that, uh, you know, works efficiently. Also, we've had uh, intellectual property uh, advice or support uh, externally. I mean, an ad hoc for every time, uh, every project we needed. I mean, uh, having that internally uh, for an institution like ours is not an obvious thing. It depends very much on, on the, you know, the amount of uh, output in terms of patterns and so on that you have. It is not for us worth. And we also like to, you know, access uh, the patent agents that are most suitable for every case that we handle. Um, in terms of legal support, also very important, and uh, those that are in technology transfer know well that uh, we spend a big part of our life, at least technology transfer offices like ours that are very transversal, uh, we spend a lot of uh, big part of our time dealing with uh, agreements, some more important than others, but uh, it uh, takes a huge amount of time and sometimes uh, we need uh, legal advice. We've counted with some internally at the very beginning, but this was not um, experience in technology transfer, that was just a general uh, support and uh, around 2014 uh, we start to have more regular legal advice also and um, from uh, an experienced uh, lawyer I mean uh, with uh, you know a lot of background in, in technology transfer related activities so why all those story and, and uh, what is in there for uh, for you and for uh, the subject of uh, today which is uh, you know the maturation it's not just about the people it's how things are done and there I've been thinking, you know, preparing that presentation on, uh, you know, what the different periods have meant for the office uh, in terms of activity and, and uh, key aspects of functioning and so on. Um, I don't know if you will be able to, let me just see, see that, okay. Um, so when I joined the, the, the office, so there was already an existing business board, but this business board had even, you know, people from, uh, from industries that had nothing to do with our activity. And it was created for some reason. It was more a political thing than anything, but not very practical. But okay, it was there. It was up on the suggestion of the business board that uh, I was engaged, actually. They, I think they didn't know very well what for, but uh, because in the beginning they were just discussing whether I should be a product manager, whether man a project manager or, or, or what. But anyway, what, uh, you know, in the end this became was the uh, the, the, the seed for our technology transfer activities at the CRG. And I was uh, quickly involved in, in the creation of the first policy, first template agreements, and very actively in scouting um activities so talking to researchers understanding their research uh, and uh, you know building a pipeline of, of projects uh, and uh, trying to protect uh, as much as possible either actual with with patents or other types of protection or also preventively because it's also true that before I joined there had been lots of agreements that didn't pay any attention to those matters and it's true that in the end if you want to become effective in tech transfer you have to make sure that you have not compromised your IP beforehand so I was very you know, um, intensive in, in those matters at the time to ensure that things were done properly. And uh, that was a period where also the, the office was matured. But it was me alone, you know, with all the difficulties that it means. So that means that I did a lot of work on the earlier stages of tech transfer. But at some point I said, well, and so what? We can build a portfolio, we can have patents, but we have to do something with that. That's not the, that's just a name, a, a mean, not, not a name, right? That means that in 2018, as I was mentioning, uh, Xavier Rubies joined and the TTO was actually created as, a, as an office. Um, at some point, uh, it incorporated a junior member. 
And we start to gain some visibility through having a, you know, a section in our web page and initiating, you know, uh, activities towards commercialization and valorization. Uh, these valorization actions were some, you know, still unstructured, not very organized. I mean, uh, more depending on our own criteria, no goals. I mean, something uh, more um, homemade, let's say like that. But okay, it was uh, it was also beginning, and uh, it was useful to attract researchers and start building projects. Uh, we revised the policy, and at the time we were very much in, in into blocks. So you know, I was more on the internal part of uh, contacting researchers, building the portfolio, and then the other person, Xavier Rubius, was more on the commercial part and and uh, all the external representation and and uh, and everything. But there was no real team link between uh, between us, and this has an effect, and as I will show you later. And then of course we had this uh, external support that. Um, that was helpful for small things, but this was junior support and and uh, and yeah, that uh, helped uh, what it could uh, what it will help. Later in 2013, I think that was really a, a you know a, a game changer. Pablo joined. Pablo, he was uh, also a PhD, had had uh, his uh, experience abroad, had been uh, you know in in in. Uh, also involved in in uh, in industry before in one way or another, so he already had the mindset and, and the push, and he had been already um, dealing with technology transfer activities prior to joining the CRT, so he knew well the uh, the, the 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 activity, our you know our business, and he came uh, very decided to rebrand the TTO, which he did. So we did stop being a technology transfer office uh, to move to a technology and business development office, and uh, this was to show you know. Uh, our focus on, on the development and commercialization, business and development uh, of technology and and, uh, uh, and of the office. There was um, a huge effort to build a team, to professionalize the team and to consolidate the team. And this also came with, uh, you know, more exposure, external exposure and recognition with the time. Uh, a new business board was uh, built, uh, and that was important because, uh, as I was saying, the former one had little to do with uh, our activities, but was of little use. And the new one in intended to include uh, other technology transfer professionals, local pharma, and, and VCs that really understood and could help us, uh, you know, uh, build uh, on our activities. We did a huge effort to gain visibility and awareness and raise awareness internally and externally. And that came with uh, the creation of a new dedicated web page. You will see that later. New programs launched, and that uh, had to do with uh, training and dissemination programs. Uh, you know, as I was saying with Amina, the CRG Biobusiness course, introduction to technology transfer for the incoming PhD students, so that they would from start know what this is about and, and, and be aware of main aspects or main, main uh, considerations in terms of you know public disclosures and so on. And also activity of fellow program uh, to recruit people that would like to be with us uh, for some time, help us, and at the same time uh, gain some, uh, you know, some um, professional experience and, and CV for themselves. And actually, the people have uh, that have gone through through that with us, some of them uh, said that uh, you know this was uh, the most useful period for them and to to, to jump into their career. We also were um, active in creating an internal uh, proof of concept fund, uh, what we call the CRG commercialization uh, gap fund. And uh, I don't know, do you see that? Because I have a, uh, you know, um, some problem with uh, with uh, the blocking there. I don't know if, if you see my screen, you see something yes. that is blocking. Yes. yes, we see it. Yes. Oh, you see that. Uh, okay. No, we see. You do. Okay. Okay. Then it's, now it's, it's fine. Coming. It's only me then having the, the issues there with uh, with the screen. Okay. Also, again, uh, all these activities, one more, uh, we were active in, in promoting entrepreneurship through different programs. Um, and I will not go in details here through those, so uh, you can uh, have more information on, on our webpage, but uh, we built a sort of what we call a science to business concept challenge to attract uh, entrepreneurs wanting to, you know, explore the potential of their ideas. We built a program for entrepreneurs in residence, so people that uh, would have an idea or, or entrepreneurial initiative that would fit within CRG's activities, or people from their CRG willing to, you know, start a company or or, or 
or explore that uh, could be part of this uh, entrepreneur in residence program some speaker series so, so a series of of events uh, where we would invite people that would tell us about uh, different aspects uh, relevant for uh, for all these uh, aspects right and uh, um, yeah we created a valorization lab very useful as in uh, very useful. The idea was there to be able to incubate projects that uh, would later develop into, you know, uh, licenses of spin-offs. And actually, we have this space uh, used by uh, some of the spin-offs that uh, that we are incubating. And then uh, we also did a huge effort to implement an internal professional management tool that was Intium. And these were very tough years, uh, trying to put uh, in place all those programs and schemes, and and uh, moving from a you know a sort of a yeah homemade uh, way of doing uh, to a more professional one uh, that uh, I think proved uh, very fruitful. I will I will show you. And um, yeah, uh, when Pablo left, uh, as I was telling you, Annabel joined. And uh, since then, and uh, beyond uh, being very active on, on, on some projects, I will show you. Uh, we've also been trying to, you know, learn from the past because, in the end, all this activity doesn't go without, uh, you know, mistakes or things that uh, you would think you would differently, or things that at some point made sense and probably you need to revise. Uh, um, so, you know, learning from experience and finding the right balance, because one thing that we've realized with all this commercial activity, which was tricky to mature, uh, so for the maturation of the office, uh, you also lose um, a bit track or, or contact with uh, with your uh, main focus, which is the researcher. So uh, scouting, going back to the researcher, going back to scouting, going back to building relationships with them and going back to, you know, um, building a pipeline of, of future projects is key and uh, although always a priority, uh, we realize that we need to uh, devote more time to, to that. Um, because everything depends on the resources that you have, of course, this means that uh, we need to also ensure that we increase the profile of the office and find the resources that we need, but not necessarily having everything in-house. So what we are trying to rely more and more on, of, um, on external support for, for strategy aspects and for uh, proof of concept issues, for example, building uh, strategic relationships with uh, institutions like CENIO that had, uh, or has um, uh, screening capabilities and medchem capabilities that CRG does not have and complement very well our, our uh, capabilities. Um, sorry, this is, uh, I don't know why it's jumping in. And oops. Sorry, sorry, I think that uh, just jumped. Uh, do you see my screen? I don't know what's going on now there. Yep. And um, yeah, um, also finding, and this is very key, and uh, I will tell you a bit more about that. And so incorporating people in the team, but not fix uh, for the basal activities of the team, but ad hoc and linked to high value projects. Um, and this is, uh, again, I'll, I'll tell you more, it's a very, very relevant aspect. Then, of course, every time that there's a change, uh, there's been a new revision of uh, our uh, intellectual property and technology transfer office. I mean, this is a, um, a life document. And, you know, through the years, you have to revise and see how it fits uh, the new situation. That's normal. And we're also trying to really now optimize our internal organization to make sure that we don't lose more time than necessarily in administrative tasks. And someone starting a, a TTO will uh, will know or will encounter that uh, you will have uh, to spend more time than you would like to, you know, reporting and trying to find uh, or, or figure out indicators and provide indicators or, or whatever tasks that you need to think very well in advance how to you know, set those so that uh, at some point it becomes some, you know, somehow an automatic task and, and see how you can uh, surround yourself uh, with people that help you with that and, and so on. So this is some thought and we are now revising uh, things in that respect to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, we uh, deal with them uh, properly. I have to say also that uh, this process, uh, all through this process and these aspects that I'm telling you administratively, for us are particularly relevant because we went through a cyber attack that uh, made us uh, lose all our records and make, uh, you know, become very aware of, of the importance of those things, but but okay. So this is uh, a bit how the office has evolved uh, through the years in terms of, again, uh, you know, the structure of the people and the kind of activities and the focus, how we've put the focus uh, on, on the different things. Um, oh, it's not moving. 
Um, again, I will not go in detail through the programs. We have a web page, as I told you, dedicated, and you can, uh, you know, uh, play around there and see. And, and there's all the information that I was telling you very quickly. It's it's there if you if you wish. But in the end, okay, there's uh, you know, uh, I told you lots of things. Uh, but in the end, what's our core business? I mean, we are there really to to make sure that uh, that we you know, make the best out of uh, the researchers, uh, the research of our institutes uh, to find uh, market opportunities and fill uh, market needs, uh, right? That means that we are trying to bridge the gap between the faculty uh, and our research and, and uh, industry and investors uh, so that in the end we can uh, get to agreements with them and have our products or research converted into products and, and, and companies. So thinking about... Uh, about that, and that's actually our our main business. I was just trying to set, uh, you know, which are the, have been the most relevant outputs of of our activity in the office through the years, and how they fit what I was telling you a, a while ago. And if if you see that again, uh, what I was telling you, and and uh, I, you know, I put in 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 in, uh, in this timeline the different uh, startups that we have created. You will see that uh, we created our first uh, startup in uh, 2008, uh, but our second one didn't come until 2017. The third came in 2018, the fourth just now, and we are about to, you know, launch a new one. Also, in terms of this is uh, in terms of spin-offs. Of course, there's been lots of activity in between. I'm just uh, pointing to the, the, you know, the most visible things and, and things that have uh, probably more impact in a way or another. Um, in terms of licensing, uh, it was not until 2019 that we negotiated uh, the first license for a patent family that we had been uh, following and supporting since uh, for a project since 2007. Uh, uh, and we negotiated a, a, a license for a value, a face value of uh, 12 million. Um, and all these proofs actually that, uh, you know, these huge efforts that were done at the time, trying to, you know, um, build an office, uh, build a, you know, a structure office with uh, the proper human resources, professional, with, uh, with the team capabilities that were needed, with all the resources surrounding that trying to, you know, make us uh, on our community aware and make uh, our stakeholders outside also aware of, of us, of our researchers and so on. This pays off. Uh, but is that uh, actually enough? I mean, uh, and that's a question that uh, you also have to think about yourself. So, yeah, I think that uh, successful technology transfer depends, of course, on a number of factors. And maturation of the TTO is one. It's a key one. So having a TTO which is mature enough is key. But this also goes with the maturation of the ecosystem. And many times one goes with the other. All these aspects are interrelated. I mean, none of those is relevant without the commitment of the researchers. And you've uh, heard about that uh, in prior um, sessions, I think. I mean, as you saw, no, our first spin-off was created in 2008. Uh, I had been uh, working on uh, with the researcher uh, since I came uh, starting uh, technology trust activities at CRG. So that was uh, really something where a researcher was committed. Uh, but of course, I mean, if you see what I showed you before, I mean, uh, all the rest of, of activities, all the efforts put in, in, you know, in training activities, in, in awareness and in everything do also have an impact. So they are not to be, um, uh, you know, uh, underestimated. And of course, all this is nothing without adequate policies and instruments in place. And this includes funding because technology transfer is an expensive activity, it pays off. Uh, sometimes not in the short term, many times, at least in, in, in the type of research uh, that we do at our institution, it takes time. It's, uh, you know, it needs uh, funds and patience. And of course, you need to also have a reward policy for researchers so that they are motivated enough to, to get involved in those things, because in the end, they are also time consuming. You know? So it's, uh, it's a bit, uh, you know, a, a, a summary of things that are relevant. But again, the maturation of the TTO is one of the key aspects, and uh, I hope I could uh, briefly tell you or, or, or uh, you know, clarify you how uh, this was done at the at the CRG. Yep. Voila. So. Thank you very Hello. much, uh, Sylvia. It was very interesting to have the follow the the, the follow of the of the um, different steps of the creation of the TTO and uh, the the evolution of the activities. So, Antonio, uh, I will let you present uh, now 
the the president the 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 speakers from Mr. Pastor of Paris. I'll leave you the yes. floor. So thank you very much, Usama. Thank you very much, Sylvia. I think that, that was very interesting. And it kind of follows in in a way what we have been doing in the diary. And as we presented the other day, this is the structure of our do you see the screen? Yes? Yes. Yes. So as you can see, this is our department of technology transfer, which is composed of many different services and offices that all together work to develop and exploit our technologies and Nancy Pastel. And today, uh, the other day, we gave you an overall view of what is this process. And then today we are going to be focusing on two of these offices, the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Office that will be presented by Sachs Poyak and the Innovation Development Office that will be presented by Michel Perez. And the point of these two offices that uh, that uh, we'll present it today, the first one is more about uh, very early uh, funding, uh, very early innovation, detecting all these innovations that are still, let's say, in the labs and they are still not ready to be transferred. And then the second is the Innovation Development Office that will help and accelerate and mature these, uh, these innovations. So Serge, it's working um, in the well in the innovation entrepreneurship office. He has a long career of as a researcher. He actually has a PhD in immunology uh, by the Université de Paris 6. and he has been working for many many years in Institut Pasteur, but also in the international network of Institut Pasteur, like in French Guiana, uh, Polynesia, and New Caledonia, where he was actually working in different topics such as malaria and uh, bacterial toxins and also C toxins. And since the last three years, he is part of this office, making the connection between the researchers on campus and the people that work in the diary to basically make us aware of what are the hot topics that we have in the in the in, in campus. So, Serge, I will let you start uh, the presentation. Thank you, Antonio. I will try to share my screen with all of you. Um, Did it work? Yes. Yes. Okay. So everybody knows me now. <laughs> I will enter the art Sir, of the subject. Yes. Can you minimize the, the, the little screen that you have there where I can see myself? Ah, can you? Yes. Okay. If you can I minimize try. that. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Good. So um, I will talk about the early step of the tech transfer model at Institut Pasteur mainly the detection and innovation, of course, and also the funding of that innovation. I will do so normally, uh, present you briefly Dari, but it's okay now, you know all about Dari. And um, also, I will uh, make emphasis on the scientific community at Pasteur, because this is our target when we want to detect uh, uh, innovation. I will give you an overview of our rationale for detecting innovation. I will disclose our strategy for detecting innovation. And also, I will end my talk with some insight into our internal funding instrument and leave probably a take on message. You know Dari, but we are working here. Just I will enter in more detail after. Just to remind you of the scientific community at the Institut Pasteur of Paris. As you may know, this is a multidisciplinary academic research in lab science that benefits from a large campus in the very heart of Paris and is now organized into 12 thematic departments gathering diverse research entities, more than 200, we, it's to say units, laboratory, and the so-called G5 for young researcher. And um, the research carried out in this department is backed up by 20 technological platforms. As you can see here, oh, sorry, I get, uh, um, yes. Uh, there are numerous people uh, with um, diverse position and diverse origin also and they share a common space and are linked by the same spirit and values, part or legacy of our founder, we Pasteur. Keeping in mind our goal of detecting innovation 
we wonder how to make a selection of topics or scientists in this great diversity. Institut Pasteur ambition is to give new impetus to research and increase its impact on human health. Therefore, a strategic plan was adopted for um, to give uh, to people a kind of hope because this is adopted for both scientists and patient benefits. It defines three priorities uh, here in red, reflecting some of the most alarming health issues facing us, and also two concerted uh, action in blue to concentrate our efforts on the field of vaccinology and cancer, and also a third category of scientific area of interest includes the CVM disease, which remains the number one cause of death worldwide. Addressing scientists the right question, that's very important because whether we focus or not on the well-defined topics of the strategic plans, when we meet scientists, we must carefully assess the innovative aspects as well as the commercial potential of the results. Applying the selection criteria is of paramount importance because before entering the work process that could ultimately lead to the labeling of a research program, we have to be sure for this reason, our office edited by Daniel is broken down in three departments. Isabel and I are involved in the detection of innovation Alexandre and Mark, you already know, provide support at every stage of the startup process. Finally, Nadia and Isabel are in charge of public-private partnership and funding of innovation, respectively. I will take time to explain you our strategy for detecting innovation. We seek to have valuable uh, discussion with researchers, trying to make emphasis on their scientific concepts and perspective. Obviously, this strategy requires a good knowledge of the campus scientific, scientists and also to, uh, to spare time to devote to critical review of the literature or also thorough analysis of grant application. That's why we apply three practical approaches. The first one relies on the choice of a rather broad theme in order to explore the related internal landscape. The second one is a free approach according to our one personal interest in a topic or to the latest science and technology news of the campus. In the third one, which call GM, we have to find on the grant manager server collecting any funding application from our scientists, the one that is more interesting for us. This slide illustrates an example of a thematic approach using apoptosis. You can see on the left hand side the two apoptotic pathways leading to death cell death through catch phases activation. As you may know, Apoptosis is a basic biological phenomenon with right-ranging implications in both physiological in black and uh, pathological conditions here in red. Fortunately, its, its various effectors hold significant promise as therapeutic agent target. We identify a total of eight PIs working in various apoptosis-related fields, we subsequently met and followed. Now let's move to our internal funding instrument. Innovation at Institut Pasteur is supported either by DARI One resources or by funds allocated to DARI by the Institut Carnot Pasteur Microbe Santé initiative edited by Professor Jean-Christophe Olivo Marais. In the short term, we aim at boosting the emergence of or maturation of um, any project with great potential for valorization. In the long term, such projects 
would um, potentially either feed the pipeline towards the innovation accelerator or um, to attract uh, industrial partner or even to enter the process leading to creation of startup. This brings me to the end of my talk with a strange machine <laughs> designed by Daniel, who, like many of us, is fond of Leonardo da Vinci invention and discoveries. As you can see, our tech model transfer uh, is a fully integrative process of which every stage is secured by appropriate uh, internal financing instruments, see the red box. And um, as already mentioned also, uh, Michel will provide you more insight on this machine operating instruction. I thank you for your attention and uh, let you read this quotation for Dr. Isabel Buckel, our big boss. And I will comment that in line with repastor humanistic values and vision, our combined efforts aim at improving public health, generating wealth and creating new job opportunity. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Serge. Thank you. Uh, somebody, do you want to say uh, anything? Yeah, yes, I will try to and share. Is not so. And it, is it yes. okay now? Yes, yes. perfect. Thank yes. you. Okay, so we'll move now to the presentation by me, Michelle Perez, which will be the Innovation Development Office. So, uh, Michelle Perez has a PhD in uh, chemistry from Université Paris 11. Uh, he's the head of therapeutic innovation development in the Department of Technology Transfer and Industrial Partnerships. In this role, he's in charge of the accelerator of innovation that we presented today that follows the most advanced innovation projects at the Institute. He manages the orientation towards valuable, valuable assets for pharmaceutical development. He's also involved in earlier projects that could address breakthrough innovations in fields such as rare diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and gene therapy. Uh, prior to, to this position, I think it was quite important, he was a senior director in the French pharmaceutical company Pierre Favre, in charge of the preclinical research programs. And he spent there more than 25 years working from research to preclinical development in fields such as oncology, cardiovascular, or central nervous system. And during that period, he had the opportunity to work on many projects based on small molecules, antibodies, or conjugates, collaborating with academic institutes such as CNRS or universities, biotechs, and startups. And he brought all this experience to Institut Pasteur to help us bring great innovation from our researchers closer to industry. Thank you, Michel. Uh, thank you, Antonio. So now I'm going to share my presentation. Hmm. Uh, you need to share only the present the presentation part if you have two screens. Now now it's working. That's good. It's working? Yeah, now it's perfect. Okay. All right. Uh dimension for me, but uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh so uh as uh, Antonio said uh, I'm working with this, uh, what we call Innovation Development Service, and uh, we try to bring uh, project maturation and the racing uh, through the Institut Pasteur Accelerator. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, my presentation, we go through the, the presentation of the Development Innovation Office, uh, then why we did uh, build an accelerator, and then the uh, accelerator process. So I think now you are familiar with this uh, cartoon that shows uh, the different uh, uh, offices in in, um, in the DARI, in the tech transfer of Institute Pasteur. So I will now focus on this uh, uh, innovation development office, uh, which is mainly uh, oriented towards uh, the acceleration and maturation of the, of the different uh, uh, project uh, coming from our researcher and as you can see uh, we are just uh, after 
the IEO uh, presented uh, already by Serge, uh, which is more on the scouting of the innovation. And then we arrive after for the uh, maturation and development of those innovation. And then be behind us, there is uh, the real tech transfer with the business development and then the uh, post-contract management office. So we are really in the middle of the process. And so uh, how did we build this uh, office? Uh, this uh, office was uh, started uh, almost uh, a year and a half ago. It was the uh, beginning of, uh, of last year. And uh, uh, Isabel Bucker, who is in charge of the diary, uh, decided to build this uh, office uh, based on people coming from the industry. She wanted to bring the knowledge of the industry into the, into the academic field. Uh, in order to, to be able to use the same uh, kind of, uh, of way of proceeding for our research. So uh, uh, it starts with uh, the right people. And so we, we work in, in four areas, uh, diagnostic, therapeutic, vaccines and technology. And so uh, uh, Isabel hired uh, four, per, four person uh, for exp experience all PhD uh, with a strong background, uh, I would say industrial background in their domain. So for technology, uh, there is Elodie, Brian Tisler. Uh, she worked for many years with a, a company called Berta in France. Uh, and then now she is working since uh, a few years now at Institut Pasteur, uh, trying to work uh, mainly on technology. So we anticipate microfluidic, microscopy, imaging, uh, visualization, reagents. So technology for us, it's a lot of different stuff uh, uh, on which she tried to build a new uh, project product. For the vaccines, uh, uh, we have Christian Gerk. Uh, she has worked for many years uh, with uh, Novartis in, uh, in developing a new vaccine. And she's doing the same work uh, at Institute Pasteur. Uh, trying to uh, develop new approaches for mainly global health, uh, neglected diseases, and emerging diseases. Uh, for diagnostic, you may know Sebastian Kenney. Uh, he has worked also for many years with uh, uh, by, uh, Fondation Biomérieux, and then for other uh, small entities. And he has now joined uh, Institut Pasteur last year uh, to bring all the diagnostic uh, projects uh, to industrial development. And myself, as uh, Antonio Manchon, I spent more than 25 years in the pharma industry. And uh, now I try also to bring all the therapeutic projects uh, to, uh, to a more advanced project able to transfer to industry. So uh, what is the goal of our activities? Uh, the main goal is to boost the tech transfer and how to do that. So as we mentioned, uh, in, as an innovation development office, uh, we try to build on the different uh, projects in order to, to make a, a, a full portfolio uh, in uh, Institut Pasteur, uh, based, of course, uh, on the uh, patent portfolio, but also on the uh, defining more precisely what has to be done on the different projects. So we have to, to make a selection of the project uh, define the key deliverables, uh, make a lot of uh, project management, and also uh, try to support the, the funding uh, with the interface of the grant office, of course, uh, but it could also be uh, with the uh, foundation, uh, uh, NGOs, or industrial contacts, and also, as mentioned by Serge, with the Carnot uh, Pasteur funding. And then when it's uh, uh, well advanced, it, it can go to startup creation or licensing. And this is supported by uh, uh, the business development and also the, the service with, uh, with Daniel. So uh, why finally did we decide to build this uh, accelerator? Uh, you know that uh, in, in academic research, uh, there is a big gap, uh, often called the Death Valley. Uh, this is uh, described here. Uh, the main challenge for academics in commercializing important new discoveries is the technological development gap. That is the gap that exists between early stage invention and the stage that innovation technology must reach to become viable and attractive candidates for industrial transfer. 
I have summarized this by, in fact, the de-risking steps. Okay, uh, when you want to bring a value to an invention, you have to de-risk this invention in order to show to your partner that uh, it worth uh, uh, buying it. So uh, our accelerator programs combine a funding strategy, technical support, and business expertise to help promising innovations move from the lab to the commercial field. Uh, each of our acceleration programs we focus on creating new partnerships to best meet medical and societal needs. So we never forget that uh, we are working at Institut Pasteur and we don't want to, to transform the Institut Pasteur into a, a fully uh, pharma or diagnostic uh, company. Uh, we, are we are still focusing on, on neglected disease, rare disease, uh, but we try to bring uh, more feedback on our invention. Uh, in the future, the invention will transfer very rapidly to, uh, to startup or to um, uh, industrial. Now we try to keep them in order to, to increase uh, their value before doing this transfer. So uh, to pursue in the objective of the uh, accelerator, uh, we try to identify and pull uh, the resources on the scientific project with the highest development potential. That doesn't mean that we don't put money or uh, input in, into less advanced projects, but we try to prioritize uh, our most advanced um, and more interesting projects in order to put more efforts and, and more funding on those projects. Uh, so we have to, to establish a sustainable development strategy uh, for this project with visibility to five uh, to seven years. I will come back to this. Uh, we try to answer the uh, complementary uh, scientific development necessary for uh, technology transfer. Uh, we try to provide opportunities for scientists uh, wishing to develop the application of their research. And thus, we try to reconstitute the portfolio of license projects. Uh, we try to increase the number of uh, uh, invention disclosure, as mentioned by Serge. Uh, we try also to increase, improve the lifespan of our patents after technology transfer. And also, of course, try to promote the creation of startups. Uh, to do so, we have to adapt the organization to serve this objective uh, without in any way reducing the fundamental research activities of the researchers concerned. I think uh, we already uh, hear that we need the commitment uh, of the researcher that want to do this kind of, uh, of a transfer of innovation. And this is very important for us to work closely with the PIs uh, in order to explain how they could do uh, very good science, but also how they can uh, use a very good science they have performed uh, to find a new way to treat uh, patients, for example. So, uh, what is uh, the, the accelerator process? So, we, we have co constructed uh, this uh, accelerator process uh, between the tech transfer office and the scientists. Uh, this project uh, engineering and to build a new pipeline of program de dedicated to innovation. And the pipeline supplies downstream a very limited number, as I mentioned, uh, of program whose labelization is based on a selective process. So we have four uh, main criteria, uh, the science and the, the disruptive aspects of innovation. Uh, Serge mentioned the breakthrough innovation, that's very important and we try to identify as soon as possible uh, really disruptive uh, science. Uh, the strengths uh, of the associated patents as well as the dependence on our technology, uh, the product development by uh, integrating internal capacity on their partnerships, and the, the potential markets, its accessibility as well as competing developments. So this is usually uh, what is performed into the industry. We have to take into account our competitors in order to differentiate our innovation and to really build something new to the market. Uh, in the therapeutic field that I know better, uh, if you don't bring something better to already uh, known drugs, it's almost impossible to, to bring it and to reach the market. So uh, I, I came to a more simplified uh, cartoon than the one that was presented by Serge, uh, just to simplify it. So this cartoon shows you uh, exactly what I explained. Uh, so we try, the objective is to build 
uh, a pipeline of projects and we, we gave us five to seven years. Uh, what we did is we started with uh, uh, analysis all the projects of uh, uh, Institut Pasteur and we identify around 500 to 1000 projects. So that's a lot of projects and we also uh, 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 analyze, analyze all the patent families. We have around 200 patent families into uh, City Pasteur. And so altogether, that was a lot of information on which we made a cartography. And uh, we uh, also discussed a lot with some of the PI on the different projects. So all that was engineering uh, on the project and engineering on the patents in order to uh, arrive with a, a lower number of projects that we can uh, analyze more deeply. And then we end up with uh, a number of projects, I will come back to it, that were um, introduced into the accelerator. And to do so, we needed to labelize some of them. And to this labelization, we use external and internal experts that gave us some advice on the, uh, the interest of the project. Uh, and some of the external experts were people from industry that uh, really have a, a good knowledge on the specific field in which uh, the projects were uh, oriented and were able to tell us if there is a really a need, a position that we can have for this specific in innovation. Of course, this was also uh, completed by pattern, by financing. And also, this is very important, uh, project into the innovation uh, of Institut Pasteur uh, we gave them a high priority, high, high involvement. Uh, so that means that we follow uh, more precisely those projects compared to all the other projects that we have uh, identified. And also, and of course, the objective is to end up either with this uh, different solution, license, startup, uh, development collaboration, industrial partnership, or we can also transfer to a non-profit organization. So to, to give you a, a small idea, when we end up with uh, uh, around 80 projects from the uh, uh, cartography, we then uh, uh, put uh, the different projects into different priority level from P1 to P3. And then from, from the P1, we selected a limited number in, in, in each field of projects. We end up with 14 projects. For the 14 projects, we made a very deep analysis that end up with seven what we call pre-labelized projects. And finally, we end up with only four labelized projects. So as we mentioned, uh, we have a very selective process in order to be able to put uh, more involvement, more financing uh, on a very limited number of projects. And then this was uh, for the first round. So this is the, the 2020 um, labelization process. And of course, we hope that we have the same kind of uh, labelization next week and we, then we will add four new projects to the four first one and of course some of them will stop and so we, we will try to find to uh, to end up with around 10 to 15 uh, projects in the process of uh, accelerator uh, when we'll be on the let's say the cruise level so uh, what do we do when we do this maturation accelerator steps so we try to teach the, the scientists uh, the good way to proceed with uh, the innovation. So uh, I have to tell you that it was a big change for the scientists. We are not used to that. And that's also why we have people from industry. So first of all, we, we ask them to build a TPP, which is a target product profile. Uh, here you have an example for therapeutic. Uh, what could be a TPP? Uh, so we ask them to define what is uh, the exact mechanism of action of the invention, uh, what kind of product they're expecting. It could be small molecule, it could be antibodies, it could be peptide, for example. Uh, what is the uh, efficacy which is expected? Uh, let's say it could be one micromolar, it could be 10 nanomolar. Uh, we, we try to, to give goals into the, the optimization phase in order to know exactly when to stop. Uh, what will be the exact indication? It could be, uh, uh, I don't know, malaria, it could be uh, uh, oncology, it could be different kind of indication. We try to, to make them think exactly what will be the, the first indication uh, in which we are going to develop the invention. Uh, what is the target population? 
Is it children? Is it resistant patients? Uh, what is the route of administration? Could be IV, oral, uh, etc. And uh, this, this is very important. What could be the advantages compared to existing products? And also, what is the patent situation? Okay, also, we have to determine what could be the go no go of the project. Uh, we don't give them the funding for uh, uh, two or three years without uh, any uh, go no goes. So we try to define very specific go no goes in order to be sure that after a certain time uh, we are able to say if we have to pursue or not the specific uh, project. Uh, as I mentioned, we have to identify the deliverables. Uh, we can bring supporting studies. For example, for therapeutic, we can make, bring uh, pharmacokinetics. Uh, toxicity. This is very important for them, even for publication, because if you bring uh, pharmacokinetic uh, information before doing, for example, in vivo studies, you are able to confirm that the compound that you are administered uh, is really uh, circulating into the animal, and what you are seeing as an effect is really due to the compound that you are evaluating. Uh, we also try to build a, a development plan and a, a financial plan. I put here a small example, what could be a development plan. So uh, a development plan here is an example for uh, one of our antibody. Uh, we try to determine the different steps and how long it could take, as well as with the go no go that you can see here, and also but the budget associated with each go no go. So this is very precise uh, business plan, is very close to what we could find into the industry, but this is very important to know exactly where to go. And if I can show you a few steps here, uh, for example, for development plan, you have a, a humanization step, you have the, all the pharmacology that has to be performed with a specific uh, humanized antibody, and then you have all the uh, non-GLP uh, uh, PK, uh, then you have non-GLP uh, TCR, etc., etc. Even with the, the CMC part, the production of the antibody uh, that we can start to, to work on. And also, we use uh, experts' uh, advice uh, to help us in, those, in some of those um, specialities. And I think that's it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much, Michel. Thank you very much, Serge and Sylvia. So it was very interesting um, to know the process of development of your structure uh, in the DARI and also in the CRG at the TBDO. And we see uh, that uh, for, for CRG, they, uh, they put also the creation of startups that was a uh, uh, focus on the creation of startups. Um, do you have also some experience, uh, Michel and Serge, with the creation of startups uh, at Institut Pasteur Paris uh, uh, through the different uh, steps in the evol evolution of the of your of your uh, strategy? Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, we didn't mention it because it was not uh, the topic of our presentation, but uh, we can tell you uh, compared to exactly what uh, Celia presented. Uh, during the, I think, uh, 30 last years, it was 30 uh, startups that were built uh, into Institut Pasteur Paris, and 20 today are still alive. So that means we are able to, to bring uh, startups uh, from, uh, from uh, innovation to uh, the creation of startups based on those innovation. And uh, very happy to see that uh, most of them are still alive uh, after many years. Very important, yes. Maybe, uh, I don't know, Serge, who is more maybe in this department, or Antonio uh, could comment. But, Antonio, uh, yes. I, mean, I just I would just mention that um, in our office, headed by Daniel, uh, two guys are involved in startup development. That's um, two, uh, on, uh, sorry, I forget your name. Uh, then, Mark. Uh, yes, Mark, Mark yeah, and Alex. Alex. Sorry, sorry. Yes, Mark, and Alex. Are devoted to the development and to help every stage of the development of startup. So, so uh, there are uh, yeah. very specialists in it, but I'm not one. <laughs> sorry for that. No, I think the difference there, sorry to interrupt, is that of course we are a small office from a small institute, so we have less less uh, separated units. So we deal uh, at the office with all the different steps. So I mean, we are max four people, three 
for people depending on on the period. So that's uh, but of course, Institute Pasteur and the Sun now has uh, uh, yeah, this is active startups uh, taken care by the relevant departments for sure. Yeah, the, the only big difference, I mean, this is the, the, I'm just sharing the screen. I mean, you, this you can find in our website. So if you go to startup creation in our website, you can see up here, we have 30 startups as Michelle uh, presented, 20 that are still that were uh, active in, acquired by a third party, uh, six that are listed, two that are still hosted in ic 2 Pasteur, uh, two that are still working with researchers within ac 2 Pasteur, and, and then one even a joint laboratory. And the only difference I see compared with uh, with Serge is that we don't have so, so many startups that are related to technology, so that are omics or, or, or any other um, digital technologies, which compared with Serge, I think you have way, I mean, all of your startups have, have some omics, integrated in your in your structure if yeah, you understand. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's the big difference you're more technological than we are I mean we are I think this is also the traditional kind of research done in Pasteur is more diagnostic yeah. therapeutics and vaccine and or even think, today it's proven and I think what we are lacking is all the omics part which I think you have way more experience than us from my point of view yeah, yeah. And, and, and on our side we are lacking the but again we got our first therapeutics uh, recently and we hope uh, so <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> We will have to share experiences. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, a I lot of experience. Well yes. Labs, um, yes. um, Microomics, I know them. So uh, they are excellent startups that are, you know, developing amazing technologies. So that uh, I agree that in, in that you you have a great experience that we could even learn in yeah, Institute Pasteur. I think this was... uh, it comes with the historical reasons and the focus of our research, as you mentioned. No? But in the end, things so uh, take maybe a lot more or less time for each of us. But uh, you know, we will all get there. Thank you, Sylvia. So I, I, will, I will let uh, the, the floor uh, give some questions because we have, I think, some question here. Uh, since uh, last week, we have also a session dedicated to startup creation. So it was very interesting. And uh, the Institute Pastor of Tunis is also looking, looking to, uh, to get some experience in this field. So uh, l l let's uh, find who is Find Access. <laughs> I have a question from Find Access. Yes, it's me. Yes. Yes. Okay. First, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you. Really uh, interesting uh, presentation. We uh, we got uh, interesting information that we can report in our uh, deliverables, and uh, I think you will benefit from your huge experience with, uh, I mean, uh, TTO activities. Um, Okay, we 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 uh, you demonstrate that maturation and acceleration acceleration process and steps are important. Uh, how many times do you think it's important to, to succeed with maturation for one uh, researcher, young researcher, aiming to uh, create a startup on a product or process or any or services? Um, is it more or less six months or or uh, much more time is needed to to, uh, to go further with the steps and business plan and uh, also maturation of the because I as I uh, maybe Michel Perez uh, so it's important to, to uh, also um, continue for researcher and uh, PhD students or maybe postdoc with some uh, data, uh, even if they're create, aiming to create a startup, it's important to continue with scientific part of the project. So it's uh, yeah. a, a bit important to, to, uh, to deal with both uh, activities. Uh, sometimes it's not a business. No, oh, yes. Yeah. So, so to answer the first part of your question, uh, of course, it depends on the invention. It, it's much faster when you talk about software or imaging or, or technology. Uh, and then if you go to the other side on, on vaccines or on, the, on therapeutics, of course, the, the timing are not the same. But usually what we give as an objective for the, uh, at least in Pasteur for the accelerator is two years. So we try to find two years of funding that's why we try to anticipate uh, 
already uh, well advanced projects, uh, already uh, let's say mature projects, and which will mature. build all the what we we call the developability. Uh, that means all the preclinical steps are all uh, in the diagnostic. It will be uh, uh, to build a, um, a prototype uh, in order to be able to to show that uh, your invention is really um, uh, possible to transform it to, into something uh, that will be uh, validated for an industrial. Uh, I give you an example in the therapeutic field, which is very easy. Uh, if you mm -hmm. if you start to 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 build the developability, uh, which is, uh, for example, the TOC study, toxicity study. Every, everyone mm -hmm. can understand the toxicity study. Yeah. And if you show that your compound is toxic, then it's, it's the end of the project. Okay. And if you want to build a startup and you realize that once you have built your startup and spend uh, many months to build a startup, that your first compound is not uh, is toxic, it's, it's the end also of the startup. So that's why we try to bring this uh, information very early on on the process before launching uh, everything. So that's an example, but it could be also, uh, I don't know, production pro problems. Uh, you know, manufacturing of uh, inventions sometimes is very difficult to improve the manufacturing. So we try also to, to, to help in the first step of production. Uh, it, it can be many, many things. Uh, the advantage in, in, in Pasteur, of course, is that we have, as I mentioned, people that are really coming from industry, so they know exactly what is needed uh, to confirm that the invention is interesting or not. And then at what point, if we have made all the de-risking and then we have to go into very expensive steps, then at this point we decide to build a startup that will find money from over um, PC, for example, or uh, governmental uh, support that will help to push the most advanced steps. And of course it could fail but the, the chance of, uh, of success of success is higher at this stage. There was yeah. a question from Drink Cafe. Drink Cafe, yes. Sorry. Uh, no, there was a question. Drink, uh, Drink Cafe. Do you wanna? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, Hello, Hello. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for all the speakers. Uh, hello, Antonio. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, so, um, very nice uh, uh, talks and very um, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question, perhaps for Michelle or for the other uh, speakers. What is your main criteria? So, the main criteria that you use to select uh, the project? Okay, uh, just That's for uh, so easy. <laughs> Uh, Green Cafe is the World Package 7 leader in the Fund Access project. So uh, she is the sustainability of the project. <laughs> we try to do it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if someone would like to answer or do I, do I go? Maybe yeah. Sylvia can also mention what they do in Serge and compare what we do in Pasteur, if it is the same thing or not. Yeah. yeah, I think that uh, with, uh, with uh, yeah, so we really, we rely more on external support. We don't have everything in house. As I was mentioning, we are also trying to more and more rely on this external support. But basically, I think the questions are, are the same. I mean, uh, we have in our case early stage projects that we need to push. So uh, as uh, the other speakers were mentioning, it's important to have a clear path with a development plan towards products. So having in mind what's the target product profile, what well, would be your product and, and all the key aspects around it in terms of uh, production and, and, and uh, indications, delivery, and so on, which are um, more relevant that uh, scientists sometimes realize uh, if you want to transfer afterwards to, 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 to industry. And yeah, I mean, I mean, the same criteria as, as uh, Pasteur, they cannot be otherwise. I mean, uh, we have probably earlier criteria sometimes. Um, it's not, I mean, IP is a relevant criteria, of course, but you have always ways to, to you know, to, to skip that and to, to play around. Uh, depends on the level of development of your project. I mean, in many cases, uh, we do work towards, for example, um, developing of a compound. Of course, if you are uh, already under a Marcus formula, which is protected and uh, you have nothing to do with that, then better devote to another thing, right? But if we have ways to do medchem, for example, and, and uh, you know play around that and, and skip that, then we might go for that. But of course, then you have to prove that it's uh, you know efficacious and not toxic and so on. So I think every case is different. We have different. We don't have a 
clear focus in our projects. They are very varied. So uh, we have to define for each one, uh, you know, the plan and the goal, no goals. And this is very key. And uh, it's true that you need to do that. We do it sometimes what we do is go out when the project is very early. We try to bring it out there, ask uh, the experts and um, ask industry how they see the project, what they would like to see, how they would like to see the development. Mm-hmm. And then build out uh, the plan on based on, on that feedback, uh, which uh, we don't have necessarily in house all of it. That's uh, but I think I mean, very similar basically. I think one commonality probably could be that it's important that the researcher is motivated and they understand the process. As Michelle was mentioning that they understand that it's important to answer all these questions to be more sensible to what is the process and if you want to have a successful product. What needs to be done, and they are, and they are, and that they are happy or willing to play the game. I think the motivation of that is the key. For me, that, that would be one of them. Exactly. No, you're right. I mean, this is the first criteria. Otherwise, uh, you have no project. I mean, if you have a very advanced project, at some point you might take that out of the lab. But in the end, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, it's the expertise in the lab. Uh, many times that it's relevant. If you have a project that anyone else can do, then there's no value in that probably. Yeah. The value is, uh, so definitely, I mean, Antonio, you're right. I mean, that's, uh, I take that for granted. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, don't, <laughs> there's no project indeed, <laughs> but from there on, no. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, because I think we, we had many, many projects and I think convincing the researchers, maybe Michelle can comment on that, that was a tough part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you're right, I think once again, the commitment of a researcher is essential. Uh, I give you an example. Uh, usually people, they are doing research, so as soon as they have a, a good result, uh, I don't know, on an animal study, whatever, they want to publish. And then you have to explain them that they have to do a different doses, for example, to define what is the best doses for a specific uh, uh, model. And sometimes they, they don't see the interest once they have done the experiments, they just don't want to do it uh, many times. Or they have to resynthesize the compound and to do a, a talk study. They don't want to spend uh, three months to, to synthesize uh, a few grams or an antibody or, okay, all that, it has to be taken into account uh, into the, the fact that the, the, the researcher really wants to make an innovation and they want uh, to work with us in order to build the project. If we have to push them to do everything, most of the time it doesn't work. So this is one of the main criteria. Yeah, we fully agree. I mean, uh, that's that's exactly yeah. our experience, definitely. Thank you very much. So, so we have a question from Cinda. Yes. Cinda Zarouk. Yes. Uh, a question, do you consider the core facility technology platform for your modulation process? Uh, for example, for uh, labelizing the project selected, as mentioned by uh, Michel? So I don't hear it too well. I'm not sure I catch the question. I think the question was if you can see, we consider the core facilities also for the labelization process. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I understood. Yes. Uh, the, so, so Technology. I, I think it's yes for the maturation of the the projects. When you consider the labelizing uh, of the projects, do you consider the the projects that are more mature? So 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 uh, they they, uh, they they mostly are in a process of maturation. So they they pass through, perhaps they pass through the the core facilities. Uh, of the of the institute or something like that. I think if they make the use, if they make use of the core facilities. Yes. Uh, so this is really depending on the project once again. So it goes from from one side from the technology to the therapeutic. So it's very uh, wide um, wide uh, possibilities. But yes, it could go from uh, the core facilities. Uh, but if they have everything internally they can build a project by on their own. Most of the time it's not the case, but they could. Uh, the, the, we, don't, we don't need that in principle. What we need is a pretty well advanced project. That's the main criteria for us. And most of the time uh, I show you the table of uh, prioritized projects. And so uh, most of the time the most uh, advanced, I mean the first priority project, most of the time we are the first, uh, the most advanced. So we have a lot of discussion about that because uh, when you go to a, 
uh, breakthrough technology, as was uh, mentioned uh, on our slide. Uh, I mean, you have something completely new. Uh, you also would like to, to help and to push this invention. But if it's not ready, you understand that the accelerator, as I told you, is two, maybe three years. So if it's very, at the very beginning, it's almost impossible to bring something in two or three years. So there is a preparation, I would say, process before entering into the accelerator programs. Otherwise, it will be never ready in, uh, in a couple of years. So that's also why we push people and we try to help them also during this uh, maturation phase before applying to the accelerator before, because we want them to be ready and to define more precisely what we want to do. As we mentioned in the TPP, that's help us, uh, help them to define exactly where they want to go, what is the objective. As I mentioned, the efficacy, for example, if they want a compound that are active at nanomolar activity and we have micromolar activity, we know that we have a lot of work to do. So we, we tell them, OK, you have to improve the activity, so you have to come back to see us when you have improved this activity, or we can help you to, to do that, but uh, not in the process of accelerator, but we call uh, maturation. So Serge show you the flash maturation. That's small. I mean, not so small, but uh, uh, we give uh, around 50 K euro um, uh, subvention uh, to do what we think is necessary to be able to evaluate correctly the programs. So it's an old process. We just don't come from nothing and we go directly to the accelerator, even if there is something very interesting because it's not ready yet. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Michel. So uh, I, I, I just want to mention that we have uh, today also with us uh, Lynn from the WIPO and a uh, lot of uh, people. We have also Jessica Kessinger that was with us, but I don't think she's still with us. So thanks you very much to follow this series of webinars. And uh, this is the last one, so uh, we were uh, very proud to, to have uh, all these uh, guest speakers with us. And uh, thank you again. So I don't know if there is other question or I will let my colleague also say a few words, uh, Cinda and Balkis, uh, for this. Uh, Antonio, uh, I let Antonio before because he's also our guest today, but he's a moderator. So Mo Antonio, thank you very much for being with us uh, in this series. And uh, Damiana and all, all the participants that are with us today. So, Valkis, um, Senda. Okay, thank you very much. A very nice webinar series. Uh, it's, uh, I would like... Uh, team members, Thank you for your time, your uh, uh, presentation and your commitment with us. I think uh, with uh, all this uh, recommendation and experience, we'll uh, uh, prepare a very, very nice um, report uh, with Ankadri on uh, some experience uh, getting from uh, IP Paris or uh, CRG. And also, we'll maybe need to be back to you, uh, to you with some uh, information details, maybe that we have to consolidate be before reporting in our uh, uh, documents. And also, maybe uh, we you will uh, be uh, invited to to, to have uh, an idea about our guideline, even when uh, the guideline will be. Uh, Prepared the uh, draft yes. one <laughs> uh, and to give Sim. us uh, your uh, comments. Thank you. Sim. Okay. Sim, you, uh... okay. Uh, thank you for this beautiful afternoon of exchange and sharing. Uh, Sylvia, uh, Serge, Michel, uh, qui, uh, qui Antonio, and uh, all uh, Michel the participants. Pelé. Yes, Michel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, so you. thank you very much. And of course, I mean, the project is not over, so we'll continue working together in the yes. coming months. It's a pleasure well, to work with you. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Sylvia. Thank you. So, so could like you uh, activate all your, uh, your <laughs> camera?
for the photo. Yeah, photos. for the selfie. Since we have Tunisian, we have a lot of people who are with us. Yes. So thank you very much. Hi, and Damiana. Damiana is here. Hi, Damiana. And, uh, so see you soon and uh, keep safe. And perhaps uh, and happy Thank new year. If, yes. <laughs> yeah. and happy Christmas. Oh, Christmas. Christmas. Happy Christmas and new year. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Have a good rest. Or take care. Bye-bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Enjoy bye. your rest. Bye. 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 Happy end of the 2020. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. See you next time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Serge.